But yes, yeah, so you can open up your Bibles to what are we preaching on this morning? Daniel chapter five, right? Daniel, I, you know, after I, I did, I did tear my ACL this week, and so my mind has been a little bit consumed about trying to learn all of that's going on. So, you know, again, if I if I like fall over, it's just because my knee went in. Okay, and just you know, give me a moment, and um, I'm going to try to stay and not be a caged animal. I'm going to try to stay like right here, but uh, if I do get up, you know, just humor me. Literally, the last three soccer games I played, I think I think there might have been one game. And I came home with a turf toe, and I came home, my foot was all swollen, and then on the other foot, and then the next game that I came home, I tore my ACL. So Ashley was about done with me. Uh, when I came home with that. So make sure you tell her thanks for watching over me. But uh, we're talking about Daniel chapter 5 in the writing on the wall. I was trying to be really clever with the name this week. And then I, uh, I realized I should really just name it the writing on the wall because that's literally where this term came from. Now, just a quick reminder, we are going through Daniel. Okay, and Daniel is a book. And if you want to, again, you know, listen to, you know, uh, uh, pretty in depth uh, what Daniel's all about. Go back and listen to Jerry's message last week. He gave a really good job kind of walking us through you know, my first two sermons. I talked a little bit about it, but Jerry gave a pretty good as he was preaching Daniel chapter four, uh, but a good in depth. I'm not going to go quite that deep, but um, Daniel again is about the exiles who have left uh, Israel or left Judah and have now been taken into Babylon. And they've been taken into Babylon because of their faithlessness to God. And, and Daniel is um, meant to be a reminder of God's faithfulness, even in the midst of uh, uh, Israel in exile. And even now, we can learn and see God's faithfulness. And Daniel's an interesting book as you try to figure out the main theme. I talked about a little bit about this early on, but Daniel, the first chapter is written in Hebrew, then chapters two through seven is written in Aramaic, and then the last eight through 12 is written in Hebrew again. Um, and I believe, you know, a lot of people think Daniel's split into two, like chapters one through six, and then seven through uh, 12. I don't, I don't think that's the right split. Okay, I, I, I think it is, uh, one is an introduction and meant to encourage the Hebrews. I think um, uh, two through Seven, that's written in Aramaic, is for everyone to see, and it's meant to put God on display. And then the prophecies that we'll get to in 8 through 12 is then again meant for encouragement of um, the Jews in exile. And the reason I think that is because when you look at 2 through 8, it's what you call a chiasm, okay? A chiastic structure. And that was something that was used in ancient literature where, you know, so you look at chapters 2 and 6, Right? Is that the crest? Is that two and six? Chapters two and seven are both dealing with dreams. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel interprets it. Seven is Daniel's dream. Okay, and when you compare those, they're actually very similar. When you look at the beast that we're going to look at in chapter seven in a little bit here, in a couple, couple of weeks, uh, it's very similar to the prophecy about the um, image that Nebuchadnezzar sees. When you look at three and uh, yeah, three and six, it's persecution of the Jews, okay, and their faithfulness. You, know, you got the boys in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then you're going to have Daniel and Lyons did, okay? But right here, chapter 4 and chapter 5 is kind of the swing, all right? Da um, Jerry preached on it last week, and I'm coming back around to this. And, um, and here, what it is, is God humbling Gentile kings. God humbling foreign kings and a lot of times this this point of a chiasm it's meant to point to what is the main purpose of this book what is the main purpose of this writing and really the and as you as you start to understand it makes sense the main purpose of this writing is to show that god is still more powerful than any kingdom or nation or king out there and here god is humbling uh nations and kings, you know, and so last week we looked at God's humbling of Nebuchadnezzar and we saw Nebuchadnezzar restored. Today we see the humbling of King Belshazzar and he's actually killed immediately afterwards and his nation is then split into two. And really, I think that this is, this is what gives us the lens for the rest of the book of Daniel, that God is more powerful than all kings, all nations. God is, you know, and, um, 
and that God is what God has says is going to happen. So does it make sense where we are at? Yeah, we're, we kind of got that overview. Work that chiastic swing. And so we're going to be starting to work our way back again, but we're looking at the second part of that. Um, and we're looking at this idea of the writing on the wall, okay? Um, and so I think, I'm pretty sure this is where that, and maybe I should, I should have done a little more research on this, but I think this is where that idiom came from, right? You guys ever heard of the writing on the wall? You guys know what that means? Was that, when, when, what is, when someone says, man, the writing is on the wall, what are they meaning? Let me, let me talk to me. Right there in front of your face. What else? What are, what are they meaning? Yes, absolutely. What else? What are they saying? Like, yeah, it's there. You should have known this. Like, like literally, this is like no cap, right? We're not lying. Is that, is that right? Is that the right way to use that? Ah, oh, that's actually probably the wrong way to use that. But, you know, it's, it's right there. And when you think about it, that is what this, this chapter is kind of getting at. You know, that literally is, there, I think there literally was a writing on the wall. I'm going to get to that in a second. But it, it, that King Belshazzar should have understood what was coming. And he should have known that um, what he was about to do wasn't going to work. Uh, because he was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Um, you know, it says to some, but it was, I think it was one generation down as we look at history. So he was, I believe, the king, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And um, that we need to learn from uh, what he didn't learn from. And this is given to us, and this is a story that's meant for us to learn from. And we need to see how God is showing himself to us and then how we respond in the right way. So my big idea this morning is that we need to see God for who he is, humble ourselves before him, and trust him. We need to see who God is, or we need to see God for who he is, and humble ourselves before him and trust him. I think that's exactly what this chapter is trying to get at. So I'm going to jump in. Um, the first point this morning, is before I jump in and read this, is that God will not be mocked. Don't do it. God will not be mocked. Don't do it. Look at verse 5. So at the end of verse, chapter 4, uh, we're, at the, we're, we're at kind of the prime Nebuchadnezzar reign. We get to chapter 5, we're at the end of the Babylonian reign. And so it says, King Belshazzar made a great feast for thousands of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousands. Belshazzar, when he tasted, uh, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines that they might drink from them. Then they brought the golden vessels that had been taken or that had been taken out of the temple of the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. And they drank the wine and praised the God of gold and, uh, and of silver and bronze and iron, wood and stone. Immediately, the finger of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king of the palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote, and then the king's color changed, and his thoughts were alarmed. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters and the Chaldeans and the astrologers. And the king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have chain gold around his neck and shall be the, the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make it, it, it make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and the lords were perplexed. And the queen became, or the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords came into the banquet hall and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let your thoughts, or let not your thoughts be alarmed or your color changed. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your fathers, in the days of your fathers, light and understanding and wisdom 
and like the wisdom of the God were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers because of the excellent spirit, uh, and excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams and explain riddles and solve problems whom, uh, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. So at this point, Daniel is starting to become an old man, kind of forgotten. Um, I do believe that King Belshazzar was the uh, son-in-law to a King Nebuchadnezzar. I think his uh, father married, um, just as you look at the history, married Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. And so he's the grandson of, or he's the grandson of um, Nebuchadnezzar. And this queen is his queen mother. Um, just as, but, but what's happening here is um, they're kind of coming. So even, even to back up a little bit, like this is exactly what God prophesied was going to happen. At the same time, when you go back and you look at the history books, like this stuff is almost verbatim what we have in the history books. And so what's actually happening here is um, while they are feasting or they're about to feast, uh, they just had a, a loss to the uh, Persians, okay? And there's actually a Persian army camped outside or kind of outside the Babylonian region, and, and, and there's about to be an empire switch. And one of two things is happening, okay? Either King Belshazzar is extremely arrogant and prideful, and he thinks that the uh, walls and army that they have around this city is going to hold. And then we know from history that uh, there was actually no real war. So the, the, the Persians in the Medes, who ended up, didn't end up taking over, which was prophesied by God through King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, they actually snuck in through a river, basically. They blocked off a water and snuck in and... When they excavated uh, the city of Be where Babylon was, there literally was a like a feast happening when they took over. Like, they found the remains of like this drunken orgy going on when the Medes and the Persians came in. So exactly what Scripture is saying and exactly what was prophesied is is about to happen. So one of two things is happening: either Belshazzar is super arrogant and prideful and thinks that his walls are going to protect him. Or he's scared out of his mind and he doesn't know what to do, so he throws a huge party. One of the two. That's one of the two things that are happening. There's armies out there. And, um, but what's not happening is he, he's not turning to God. What we see here is not a king that has learned from his grandfather and learned from what's going on in, in, in front of him. Instead, he throws a raging party. Either as a form of defiance and great pride in his city's defenses, or because he's afraid and didn't know what else to do. Either way, he turns to himself and not the God that has shown himself to be oh so powerful over his grandfather. And as you look at this, okay, so King Belshazzar brings in all of these people, and you know they start to throw this this huge feast, and they start to drink wine, and you know this this feast. Uh, first is a rejection of God because they didn't turn to God. But King Belshazzar doesn't stop there. Okay, as they started been drinking and they, you know, they, 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 he, he drinks wine in front of people is probably a, a picture of them starting out this, the festivities of this great party. And then it, kind of in the midst of it, as they're all drinking and, and, and toasting and, and doing all of this, he could then commands the vessels that were taken by King Nebuchadnezzar to be brought in to this feast. So what these vessels were, was the very vessels that we saw back in chapter one that King Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple of Jerusalem. These were the vessels that were used for the ceremonial things uh, before God. And so like when, when it, all the different ceremonial cleansings, all the things that were done in honor of God, all the vessels that were given. So they would, they would, you know, when, when God gave them the nations, when God gave Israel the nations, they would take all of these gold vessels and they would put in the treasure of the Lord. They would make them beautiful 
and, you know, um, and consecrate them and give them to the Lord. And so these were meant to be used for the worship of God. And so when Nebuchadnezzar took them, it was basically Nebuchadnezzar spitting in God's face. Okay. But God humbled Nebuchadnezzar. And we're going to see this in a second. Like we, and even as, as Jerry talked about last week, and Nebuchadnezzar finally acknowledged God. But instead of learning from his grandfather, um, Belshazzar goes one step farther. He brings these vessels in and uses them uh, to party. He uses them in worship. It says that he brings them in so they might drink out of them. And then they were, first, they were brought in the golden vessels and they were taken out of the temple of the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them and they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and, and stone. These inanimate objects that we think are so valuable, they started to worship while they're drinking. It, it, was, it, was base, it, was, it, was, it was King Belshazzar giving the finger to God in the midst of, a, of a, you know, this army that's surrounding them, and he throws a party. Instead of turning to God, he turns to his own pleasures and desires, and even in the midst of that, he mocks God. You know, and it says immediately, immediately this hand, can you imagine that? You know, like they're at a rager and all of a sudden the hand appears. We don't really know how big it is. Uh, we don't know what actually, you know, but we know that Belshazzar saw it. And I think he did. And that it, drew and we'll see in a second here something on the plaster on the, on the walls and you know, even by like you know, here it says immediately the finger of the human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall the king's palace opposite the lampstand okay it's it's pretty specific okay it uses a lampstand that people would know was there and so this is from an eyewitness um other people saw it king nebuchadnezzar saw the hand itself but other people saw what was going on and it was in a direct rejection of King Belshazzar, but it was also in front of other people so that all could see and understand and learn from it. And um, so here, this is from, I'm just going to read this. This is from an introduction commentary by James Baldwin. Um, and he says this, the circumstance, cir circumstantial details suggest the testimony of an eyewitness in the case of the king himself. Uh, the evacuation of the or the evacuation of the palace has uncovered beyond three impressive courtyards a large room. So modern day excavation, okay, of this of this very region, um, uh, an impressive courtyards and a large room, uh, two hundred uh, or fifty two meters by seventeen meters, which has become uh, known as a throne room. Inside this throne room, and facing the doorway, a recessed niche in the wall. Uh, probably indicates where the king's throne stood. Uh, one of the walls was adorned in a design in blue uh, ameled bricks, but others are covered in white plaster. So it, it seems to be even modern day excavation shows this very room where this hand was drawn. And, and this is one of the things that Daniel, he gives great detail of what is going to happen for the very purpose of God saying, listen, I know all things. I control kingdoms. I control history. And even if he does it before it happens several times, both in, in uh, chapter two and as we're going to see in chapter seven again, so that it can be tested. And it is still being tested. Like that's one of the main purposes of, of Daniel is, is that these things can be seen. And as all this is unfolding, you know, King Belshazzar is losing his mind. And rightly so, right? Like he's half drunk. Maybe, I mean, maybe he's super drunk. And, you know, he's losing his mind. This, this, this army is around outside. He is, you know, their kingdom is falling. He, and all of a his hand is running on the law. His color, he, he is, his knees are knocking together. Mine are doing that right now. And his knees are knocking together. And he calls out loudly, somebody come find an answer for me. Okay. And here they do the exact same thing that, that King Nebuchadnezzar, he called the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, all of these wise men, the best of the best. The Lord, like, and some of these guys were super smart, okay? These were wise men. These were, like, we still use some of the, the, 
mathematicians and even the astrologers, some of the things that they use, we still use it. These guys were some of the smartest, and they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure it out. And so he starts losing his mind again because nobody could read this. And so his thought, you know, he's, he's, his color's changing, but finally, you know, his mother comes in. I'm, thank God for good mothers, right? We got Mother's Day coming up next week. I'm really thankful for my mother. I'm the you know, good mothers. She comes in and says, listen, don't be afraid, okay? There's a guy, Daniel, and she, she, doesn't, uh, you know, she doesn't fully understand Daniel. She, she, you know, king, you know, he has the, 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 the wisdom of the spirits of the gods because she doesn't quite understand the God of all gods, but she understands that there's something special about Daniel here. And so she says, listen, he was chief of all of these guys for your grandfather, for your father. Why don't you call him in? You know, the king made him chief of the magicians and changes, Chaldeans and astrologers because of an excellent spirit and knowledge and an understanding to interpret dreams and explain riddles and solve problems. They were found, and they were all found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Not Belshazzar, not, it's a little bit different, close. But now let Daniel be called and he will show you the interpretation. But I think when we look at the first part of the story, what God is trying to show us is that, you know, God is not to be mocked. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Your God, you know, is a God who has created all things. And God is, um, you know, and that's, all, that's been a whole part of the story of Daniel is just repeatedly God showing his ability to control kings and you know first it's seeing god take away his own people into captivity because they weren't faithfully following him but even in the midst of his people being in exile it didn't make god any less powerful and you know one of the things that people wanted to do when um they saw israel taken into captivity was to mock the god of the israelites like see how weak your god is see how faithless your god is and they would mock God. And so one of the main points that, that God is showing is that he's not going to be mocked. He's going to do what he wants with foreign kings. But it's also very important for us to understand uh, that God isn't to be mocked. Um, you know, think about it like this, okay? You know, what's, what's your, like one of the most, I'm not an artist, so what, but, but what's some of the most famous paintings out there that you've enjoyed? What, what's a famous painting you've seen personally? That you have really enjoyed. Let me give somebody give me one. Anybody? Anybody? I see my kids' drawings all the times. What? Mona Lisa. What's another one? Anybody? Starry Night. That's a good. I like that. What's that guy's name? Um, Van Gogh. We did the Van Gogh experience. That's kind of fun. Like, did you ever do that? The Van Gogh experience in Milwaukee. That's kind of cool. Um, so uh, yeah, Van Gogh. Okay, let's take a Van Gogh. And Van Gogh, the starry night, the guy was sad, man. He had a sad life. It was, that was a tough one. Um, but you know, take one of Van Gogh, one of his other famous paintings, and there's a, a great value in them just for the detail behind it, you know, just the, 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 you know, the story. And just, you know, when you, when you go and you learn some of the things and what's gone into the art and just, you know, yeah, it's, it's actually pretty amazing. But what happens if someone took mud or feces and just rubbed it all into the re original painting? That's disgusting. Like, we would be so angry. Like, people would be, like, throwing their minds to the roof. Like, why would somebody do something so stupid, right? Or maybe let's, let's you know, change this a little bit different. What happens if you just got a brand new couch? And it is the couch of your dreams, mid-century modern. Top of the line, boho. Is that right? Is it the same boho? Is it the same thing? It's close, right? Uh, you know, and it is like, yes. And then your husband or somebody comes in and they've been working and changing the oil and they sit down on your couch and all of a sudden there's just a massive oil stain over your ivory white couch. Ugh. <laughs> So beautiful, you just, you know, like, right? Why? Because there's value there. That's a, it's a precious thing. There's a great value. And now it's been desiccated, decimated. It's worth nothing. It's garbage. 
It was a thing of beauty. Man, when God is mocked, this is something that's even worse. When the one thing that is perfect and holy and completely separate of worth of all of our value, all of our worship, and we mock it, it's taking, it's taking perfection and mixing it with the most ugly, volatile thing ever. You know, this story is meant to teach us, both from Nebuchadnezzar, that in both turning and not turning to God and mocking God, uh, that, that God is not going to stand for that. And he leaves this man, and you look at it, he's, he's in shambles. He's humbled and in his shambles. It's like he's going to, I mean, he's going to die. And he, he has a judgment, right? And immediately now, um, in every case, God doesn't always judge us I- immediately. Um, you know, even when we saw with Nebuchadnezzar, God gave time. Uh, uh, but ultimately, God is not going to be mocked. He's not going to stand for this. And, um, and I think that's important for us to understand because one, like, you know, it's easy for us to get discouraged when we see people mock God. And we see people stand up and shake their fist at God. And we feel like we have to, you know, well, no, well, no, God, God's going to take care of it. He's not going to be mocked. He has power over all nations, all authority. Um, he's going to handle himself. Our job is to be faithful. But also, um, if you're a believer, I think it's important to understand, too, that it's super important that we don't mock God ourselves. And, you know, I think one of the things even to think about as we're thinking through this, it's like, well, Jesse, I don't have, you know, the the vessels from the temple that I'm using to, you know, stick my middle finger up at God, or I'm using to do, do all this. No, you're, you're right. You're not. But at the same time, as we look at the new Testament, we realize that, you know, the temple is no longer a building. It's what? It's us. When you look throughout the new Testament, we are the temple of God. We are, you know, God has given us his glory to reflect back to him and reflect out to one another and to reflect out to this world. We are the temple of God. We no longer go, you know, the, the, tur- the, the, tur- the curtain has been torn in two so that we can go into the very throne room of God because we are saints, church, and we are the temple of God. And so when we use this temple for our own selfish desires and pleasure, we're mocking God. We're using the gift that God has given us for ourselves, and God's not going to be mocked. And a lot of times we think it's, you know, little white lies or this little thing or this little thing. It's not a big deal. It's not right. No. God is not going to be mocked. And by the grace of Jesus, all of our sin is forgiven. Even if you're a follower of Jesus, you know, you're still going to have interest in heaven. But at the same time, we need to realize, man, we need to take the seriousness of what it means to, and we are living in exile. And as we live in exile, we represent God even in the midst of nations mocking him. And so we need to live in a way. And two, if you're, if you're sitting here and you're like, you know, I've never trusted in God, you know, and I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm not even exactly sure what I think about this. At, at some point, you're going to stand before a perfect and holy God and give an account of your life, a God who loved you and created you and sent his son to die for you. But ultimately, rejection is a form of mocking God and saying, God, I don't need you. And so just even take that into account. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But God is not going to be mocked. Don't do it. Two, God shows himself to us. Humble yourself. God shows himself to us. Humble yourself. When David comes and he confronts the king, uh, Belshazzar, he points back to what the king should have known from his grandfather and what would have been well documented um, um, and probably, um, you know, when, when, you know, as Jerry's preached on last week, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar kind of went nuts and lost his kingdom for years. Like the whole nation would have known about this. And God has shown himself to this nation, but they've continually ignored. Look at verse 13. Let's start reading there. Uh, Then Daniel, then Daniel was brought in before the king and the king answered and said to Daniel, you are, or you are that Daniel, the one or the one of the exiles of the king, or one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father brought from Judah. 
Uh, I have heard that you have a spirit of the gods that is in you, and, and that the light and understanding and an excellent wisdom is to be found in you. Now, all the wisdom and enchanters have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretations, but they have not shown the interpretations of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have the chains of your gold around your neck, and you shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness, <laughs> glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all the peoples of the nations and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would appoint, whom he appointed um, I lost it. All people of the nations trembled and feared before him, whom he would kill and whom he would keep alive, whom he would weigh who, and, and whom he would he raise and whom he would he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his heart or and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and the, his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast and his dwelling was with that of the wild donkeys. He fed like grass or he fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of the heavens until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdoms of mankind and sets it over all who he will. And you his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you've known all of this. But you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of the heavens. The Lord lifted yourself up against the Lord of the heavens. And the vessels of the houses that you have brought in before you, and your lords and your wives and your concubines, you have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of the silver and gold, of bronze, of iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whom your hand, your in God in whose hand is your breath and are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence, the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, mene, talik, parzin, and parzin. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Talik, you have been weighed in a balance and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So the second thing we learned this morning, I'm going to kind of get these quicker, but God has shown himself to us, humble yourself. Again, we need to remember that this is a story about Belshazzar, but we are called to learn from his story. And, um, you know, Daniel, again, is in exile from Israel when Israel was sacked. Um, but here, he's the only one that can read this interpretation. All the smartest and wisest could not figure out what was written on the wall. And, you know, that's kind of a picture of God completely rejecting Babylon. And, you know, and, and uh, you know, here Belshazzar is kind of losing his mind. He says, listen, I will pay you whatever you want. I'm going to give you a third of my kingdom. Just tell me what this says. And, King, and, and Daniel rejects payment, but he says, but I'm going to still tell you. And here's what it says. Okay, here's what it says. King Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon, was given everything from the, from the hand of the Most High God. And this is a theme that we saw through the first couple chapters that Daniel continually, and that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego continually reminded King, Bel, or King Nebuchadnezzar that his was from, everything that he had was from the king or was from the God of the Most 
high. And again, Nebuchadnezzar slowly realized this throughout. But this is a reminder. And he's saying, listen, remember that all of these things and that God gave King Nebuchadnezzar this kingdom almost to the point of complete sovereignty. Whatever King Nebuchadnezzar wanted happened. Even who he killed, he killed. Who he humbled, he humbled. Who he rose up, was risen up. God gave everything into King Nebuchadnezzar's hand until what? What happened? Pride. Until his heart was lifted up against God. To the point where he was like, yeah, this is all because I did this. This is when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly when he rejected God. So what happened? He got brought down. Jerry preached this last week. He literally, I believe literally, was taken out for a time, for a period of seven, whatever that was, maybe seven years, but whatever it was. But he was taken out for a time where he lived like a wild man. And that was intentional. Okay, King Neb- King or Daniel says that King Belshazzar should have known what had happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. This was something that was seen. King Nebuchadnezzar was a prominent figure, and it was meant for this Gentile kingdom to have an understanding of who God was and to live in light of that. And this is the King Nebuchadnezzar stayed this way until, to what? To what? Till he knew the most high God rules kingdoms and authorities. Until he acknowledged who God was. And then God restored it. I mean, Jerry preached that last week. God's grace restored a Gentile king to his position. But at the same time, at the same time, it was also meant for King Belshazzar to understand and know this. And, and King Belshazzar didn't. He rejected the teaching that God had gave him. And it says that he now raised himself up. When his heart was hard, when he brought these vessels in, it worshiped his false gods with the temple vessels. And so immediately the hand was written on the wall. And then Daniel tells him what, what it was. Mene, mene. Uh, and, and probably all of these were some sign of weighing. Okay, or some sign of weight, um, uh, it, it, but how they were inscribed. But it, but, and then Daniel kind of gives us an understanding. He says, Mene, God has numbered the days, or no, um, yeah, Mene, 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 God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Um, your time is coming to an end. You have been, you've been faithless and you have not listened. You've not humbled yourself. Um, your kingdom's coming to an end. Uh, Talik, this is, this is the idea of uh, uh, unjust weights. You have been measured and found wanting. Um, and then Perez, your kingdom will be divided, given to the Medes and the Persians, which is to fulfill the prophecy that God gave Daniel. But at the same time, this is also meant to say, listen, everything that you built is going to fall apart. This great kingdom, this wonderful kingdom that you guys, that God allowed you to have, that God gave you and showed him. So, yeah, it's going it's, it's, it's to fall from your hands to somebody else's and it's going to be divided. It's going to be a lot less great. Everything you built is going to crumble. Why? Because he didn't humble himself. He didn't humble himself. God showed himself to this Babylonian nation time and time again, and they did not humble themselves and their kingdom was lost. The church, we're meant to learn from this just as much as Belshazzar is. We are, God reveals himself so that we learn to humble ourselves. You know, in our modern day culture, uh, humbling ourselves is seen as weak, seen as a bad thing. We don't like this word. If we're humble, it means we're weak. It means we can't do things on our own. It means, you know, whatever. It means that we're wimpy. But, but let me let me pull that back a little bit. You know, one of the greatest is experience. If you've ever done this, okay, um, you know, maybe maybe you've you know, gone up in the you know mountain ranges or mountain peaks or the prairies, or you've gone out over the ocean and, you, and you've looked out over the vast ocean or a vast expanse, or you've looked up into the night sky, 
and you've just been blown away. And, um, and you just feel small. And there's just a, a much broader significance in this. And it's just a little bit of a, a perspective um, that, that, that makes you feel small and humble. But I think most people actually enjoy that. Like, you know, we know people talk about that wonder lust or whatever it's called. And people have this desire, you know, to see these things and it helps give them a better perspective on their life and blah, blah, blah. And they all have these reasons why. Well, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it a little bit different. Why do they feel? Because that's why God created us. God created us with a desire to be small on purpose. God created us with a desire to worship and to trust in him. He didn't create us to bear the weight of the world on our shoulders. We cannot do that. In fact, when we are humble, it's freeing. When we get to that place where it's like, I can't control this. I can't do this. Lord, I have no control over this universe. I can't. You, you, you have to take it. It's, it's freeing. That's why when people have those experiences and they talk about it, and the, oh, it's so free. You're right, because God created us with that. God created us with a, with a desire to humble ourselves. That's why humility, well, I think humility, you know, while pride is lifted up as this thing that we should have, and humility is the thing that's mocked, because in essence, God's kingdom is flipped. Humility is prize, and pride is disdain. And so our world flips those things on its head because the, the, the you know Satan is wanting us to believe lies, and, and and humbling ourselves before God is a good thing, and it frees us. And it says, Lord, I don't you know. And one of the reasons why our world freaks out right now when it comes to politics and when it comes to nations and things like that is because we're not humble. Because we don't trust God. And it's, you know, because when, when everything crumbles and it's like, <gasps> no, we're not meant to bear the weight of that shawl on our shoulders. We're meant to put that at the foot of the throne and do our best to be faithful and follow God. And so we need to, just like Belshazzar, we need to see God. God reveals himself to us all the time so that we can humble ourselves. He's made us to be dependent upon him. You know, and even, you know, King Belshazzar, you know, he, uh, he was rebuked for not seeing how God taught himself through his grandfather. But, you know, we look at passages like uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 15 through 20 or Hebrews 12. You guys can write this down, go study your own, but Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Uh, it, it reminds us that, not only do we have the promises of God that we've seen throughout the Old Testament, and not only do we have the other things of God, that, you know, the, the ways that God's, but we have Jesus himself. Jesus came in the flesh, you know, uh, uh, Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus was the very likeness of God himself. I'm just going to go back and read that real quick so we can see it. But in, in Colossians 1, um, Let me get there quick. Colossians 1, 15. I'll start verse 15. He is, I'm going to read 15 through like 17 or 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. In everything, he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, uh, to reconcile himself, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So not only do we just have the faithful promises of God, but we have the very image of God in Jesus. When Christ came down and died in our place and took our place, we got the full picture of God. And so we can see God. God has revealed himself. We're no longer looking for a mystery. We're looking for a person in Jesus. And that we are called to daily remember and humble ourselves before. And that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. 
So what does it mean? We need, we need to regularly acknowledge God as our Lord and King. That's what we worship. That's what we pray. Prayer is a, a, depend, a, a holy dependence on God. Worship is giving him his authority as king. When we sing God praises, we are saying, we're doing that very thing. We are humbling ourselves. I am not worthy. You are worthy, God. It is healthy for us to do that. It is freeing for us to, we don't deserve, we are reflections of God's glory. And so when we take God's glory, we take a burden that we are not meant to carry. But when we worship God, we're saying, we are not worthy. You are worthy, God. Uh, we need to pray dependently, regularly. We need to learn what our functional saviors are. You know, here we see King Belshazzar turn to partying in his own, you know, walls around his kingdom to functionally save him. And they were, if, we, if we're going to worship Jesus as king, if we're going to humble ourselves, we need to learn what our functional saviors are. When you are bored and you just want more, when you are helpless or hopeless, when you are depressed or anxious, when you are wanting something, what do you go to? What do you spend your money on? What do you use your leisure time for? A lot of times, those are our functional saviors, our kings, our rulers. And we need to humble ourselves and confess those things and put Jesus back in his rightful place. And church, we need to do this daily. I mean, I, I, I have, you know, there's a couple guys, I don't remember who quoted it first. I think I first heard it from Paul Tripp. But um, he talks about the idea that we have gospel amnesia every day. I, I need to be reminded that Christ is king. That I need to humble, I need to see God for who he is revealed to us in the person of Jesus and humble myself afresh every day and put Jesus back on the throne. Because every day I put myself back on the throne. We need to humble ourselves. And last, I'm going to end this real quick. You know, God asks, or God acts on what he says. We need to trust him. So, so we, need to, you know, we need to realize that God's not going to be mocked. Don't do it. We need to realize that God shows himself. We need to humble ourselves before him. And lastly, God asks him what he says. Trust him. Look what he says real quick in verse 29. And then Belshazzar gave the command to Daniel. And Daniel was clo- or gave the command to Daniel was clothed with purple and, uh, purple and the chains of gold and of, were put around his neck. And the proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom in that very night. Belshazzar the, Chal- Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom beginning at 62 years old that very evening. Now, just a, a few quick things in closing as we look at this. One, this was a prophecy given earlier in chapter two. Exactly what God said was going to happen started. The, the image of gold was knocked down and the two things, the Medes and the Persians. And so the, 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 if you look, okay, in, in history, um, the Persian army is the one that came in. But here, Darius the Mede was the one who was leading. This is combination that was taken out. Even history points to this. But it also shows that, you know, with Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself. And repent, you know, and, and, and turned back to God. And so God raised him back up. But eventually Belshazzar didn't, and God acted. And God acted on what he said he was going to do. And God has not done, whether for his promises yeah. or for his condemnation. And at some point when God is going to come back, everything that he says is going to come true. And so our job is to trust him. I mean, one, if, if you're a believer, this should bring great joy because at the end of all of this is heaven. At the end of all, God is not going to be mocked. God is on his throne. God is still ruling. None of this is a surprise. Anything that we suffer, whether as a country or a nation or a church or individuals, is a surprise to God. He knew it was coming. He has this all under control. None of it is a surprise. It is all for his glory in our good. He is on his throne. And what he says is going to come true. Well, Jesse, what about all the people saying all these things against God? You know, it looks like all of these, you know, uh, you know all of these people are rejecting and, fight, and God's got it. <laughs> we don't have to worry about it. God is going to deal with all of those people. 
Our job is to be faithful and proclaim him and to proclaim Christ is king. But then two, our job is to trust him. I mean, how often does something happen where immediately we don't trust God? God, okay, no. It's May 4th or May 5th, but I got to get a Star Wars analogy in there, all right? Uh, we were watching, um, we were watching Jedi or uh, Return of the Jedi last night. But think about, you know, if you've seen Empire Strikes Back, okay? When Luke goes and trains with Yoda, all right? Yoda's 900 years old, okay? This guy's been walking with the Force for a long time. He has trained a lot of Jedis. And here's like 23-year-old Luke trying to tell Yoda what he should really be doing in his training. Okay, and I've often looked at Luke and been like, Luke, you're an idiot. Like, Yoda's 900. He's been doing this for years. Why are you not trusting what he says? He knows what he's doing. He suffered in fall, and he's done this, and he's done that. And that's Yoda. We do this to God. We do this to God when we don't trust God. God is going to act. God's going to do what he says he's going to do. We've seen it throughout all of history. We've seen it throughout the book of Daniel. We've seen it in the faithfulness of Jesus. We know God's going to come back. He is going to act. And if you're a believer, man, you got to trust Jesus that he is going to work through whatever situation that you're in, not turning to our own things. And and if you're sitting here and you've never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he is going to come back. And without him, you and I are broken, condemned to hell. And the only thing that saves us is the revelation of Christ himself. And so we need to humble ourselves and trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So Matt and Jill and Frank are going to come back up and they're going to lead us in worship. Um, but as, as we do, just a couple things to, as we're coming in conclusion. We need to see God for who he is, humble ourselves before him, and trust him. And this whole, this, this whole chapter was meant to be just a, a story for us to follow along and learn from. You know, one, and just, so just be, be reminded, man, God is not going to be mocked. What are the ways where you mock God? What are the ways where you have taken the blessings and the gifts that God has given you and you've used them for your own sinful desires and pleasures? And we need to repent of those things and we need to take those things seriously. And by God's grace, Jesus has paid for those already. But at the same time, here and now, we need to take those seriously. And if we're, if we're gonna be faithful believers, what does it look like for us to say, Lord, how am I mocking you? And just repent. Two, Take time this week and humble yourself. When was the last time you laid face down on the floor, just in the midst of all the frustrations and trials and anxieties, the, just the difficulties of this life, and laid face down on the floor and been like, God, I don't got it. I can't do this. I'm trying to take too much control over this. I, I don't have the power to handle this. Lord, you're it. When was the last time you said, Holy Spirit, show me my functional saviors. Show me the things that keep me from allowing you to have control of me. And then lastly, take time and look at what God says. How are you not trusting him? What promises are you not believing? What hope do you not have? You know, it feels like sometimes it feels like, you know, our whole world's caving in on the church and on believers and, you know, it can feel like everything's falling apart, but man, God's got it. And, and our job is just to trust and believe faithfully. And so what ways are, are you continually acting like you know better than God? And so you are trusting in your own abilities. You're trusting in the world's promises and just confess. In church, ultimately, we humble ourselves before God and trust Him. That's what we do. That's what we do in worship. That's what we do in prayer. That's what we do in God's Word. We submit ourselves under it. And so even as we're coming and closing in a couple songs, just do that this morning. Humble ourselves before God. Praise Him. Worship Him because He deserves it. And then be encouraged. Be encouraged because we're humbled 
And now we're at peace with God. We can walk and do what he's given us because we don't have to worry about anything else. And God, we come before you this morning. And God, we're thankful for just the reminder to this story. God, we're thankful that even in the midst of the exiles being taken from their country and even the nations mocking you, Lord, you didn't stand for it. God, that you are the God of all nations. You are the God of kings, God of nations. And God, that you put it on display again and again and again. And even here at Bachelors Hour, Lord, we can learn from the same story. So God, I pray that we'd be a church that doesn't mock you. God, show us the ways that we trust in other things. And God, mock you with the temple that you have given us. God, I pray that you would help us daily see you clearly. God, that we would humble ourselves before you. God, remind you all in our face, Lord, that we need you day in and day out. And Lord, whatever that we are struggling with to believe what you say, God, that you would give us the faith to believe it. God, that you would give us the urgency to believe it. And God, I pray for any, believer, any person in this room who have never trusted you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would allow them to see you clearly. God, one, that they would see their sin against you, a perfect and holy God, God, a beautiful creator, uh, God, who we have spit in your face time and time again, but God, that we'd also see a perfect Savior, and God, that they would come to trust in you as their Lord and Savior for the first time, even this morning. God, to continually remind us of our need of you. And God, even as we take a time and turn to worship you again through song, oh Lord, I pray that we would give you the praise as our King. God, that we will give you the praise as our Lord and Savior. God, help us make much of you. In Jesus' name.